The main political disconnect that affects us all is this. If we want to avoid war or the collapse of democracy, just small things, we need to address global problems with global solutions, not national solutions. Addressing a global problem with a national solution would be like trying to face global warming by installing more air conditioners, which might make the problem worse. All of us have needs and problems. Some of us may connect better than others to the needs and problems of others, but none of us knows how to solve them all. And the uh, disconnect between needs and solutions depends greatly on whether uh, the type of problem can be resolved with one individual solution or else we need a sort of collective effort to resolve it. So when, starting from the simplest case, when the, need, the disconnect between needs and solutions depends or at least is, uh, can be resolved by one innovation, the elimination of the gap is just a matter of time. Everyone has recognized that we would contribute to the solution of environmental problems if we switch to electric cars. And the gap in that case was just a technological one, so that if a company manages to find a, the way to produce an electric car at a reasonable price, the demand will be there for it, profits will appear, and all the other companies will have to follow suit, or else <laughs> lose the entire market. But the same type of uh, environmental deterioration problem has other dimensions where one innovation cannot suffice. Think of the extinction of tunas or whales that we may face in a few years. It's pretty difficult to imagine a solution by one company that would override the incentives to overfish tuna, barring, of course, the, some smart invention of a substitute for, for sushi that would equally satisfy chic urbanites. Many of the problems we face in real life are of this nature, namely one individual solution does not suffice, and we need a collective effort. And uh, you would think that in this type of situations, politics can help. Um, doesn't always help. You know, if you think of, uh, of uh, the last, uh, one of the current world leaders' reaction to global warming, he said, quote, I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. Isn't this uh, nationalistic attitude a bit like buying more air conditioners or throwing a tuna party? And now I come to my bread and butter example of this type of problem that has to do with globalization and tax competition. Ireland, Luxembourg, and other tax havens or heavens are overfishing. How do they do it? They are obtaining huge benefits from offering almost zero capital taxes that attract multinational companies, and no individual decision by any other country deters them. This overfishing type of problem will create a big problem, that is that countries all around the world will have not enough money to face the needs of their own people. And much like for tuna overfishing, 
to solve this problem, we would need consensus or unanimous agreement, no deviations, no cheating, no free riding. And this is hard to obtain. And for this reason, the widening disconnect, also helped by some political leaders to be so wide, is a problem that emerges, and it's, it's uh, especially when consensus and coordination are technologically necessary. So let's give a concrete example. Consider the typical worker, Joe, and his typical employer, Bob. So, if a man like Joe the Worker is not worried about his job, but mostly worries about his salary, then his political alignment is likely to be against the excessive profits of Bob the Boss. If you think about the political conflict in Italy in the 1960s and 1970s, it was basically class conflict, or if you wish, political conflict between the representatives of Joe on one side and the representatives of Bob on the other. And in the 1930s, in the US, again, it was mostly a distribution conflict. What the national strikes and union fights brought about was a readjustment of the worker employer relationship towards a redistributive New Deal, which brought about a solution. So politics there worked because it just needed to take a stand on the distribution conflict, which Roosevelt did. But jumping forward to today, Joe does not fight with Bob that much anymore. Joe fights with Pedro, the immigrant, and or Dong, the Chinese competitor. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, Joe could, could maybe also worrying about Anna, the woman, given that, fortunately, culture has changed and women compete too. So faced with uh, all these new fears, the fear of Pedro, of Dong, and Anna, Joe is becoming more conservative to protect himself from Anna, perhaps. He wants to build a wall to protect himself from Pedro or vote for someone who will build it. And wants, to, wants more protectionism against Dong. And see, all these three forms of reaction to fear are on all fronts bringing us towards one word, nationalism. And as I argued, national solutions are not the way to go to solve global, global problems. The gap may actually be widened by national solutions. And the biggest gap widening threat for Joe is actually bit. Bit the robot. You know, Bob loves Bit. Why? Because Bob knows that Bit is productive, is uncomplaining, doesn't need social security, never has bad breath, probably, <laughs> unless you build it that way. And above all, Bit is easy to transfer to another country. And of course, Bob would prefer to move Bit to a country that has tax laws that are favorable to Bob. This is important because it relates the tax competition with this. So what's the problem? Joe is now risking much more after the entry in the picture of Bit. Why does Joe risk more? Because Bob, by all those features that I mentioned, is happy to have bit because he pays less taxes per unit of, of, of outcome. And now, Joe, if he loses his job, he will, have, he will be in a country that at the national level will have 
less money to support his needs. And indeed, the, the risk of losing his job is not negligible. Technological changes are allowing the bobs to replace more Joes with bits. And if technology indeed, as some say, is going to make it possible to replace 40% of existing Joes with bits, then we could experience situations even more dramatic than now with revolutions, with revolutions of people with uh, yellow jackets, red jackets, what have you. Conflicts like, in a sense, fishermen fighting for the last remaining tuna. So, let's see this in an economic context. There are fewer and fewer Joes to pay labor-dependent taxes. And there are less and less taxes that Bob is willing to pay or needs to pay given tax competition. So the total tax revenue to face growing welfare costs is going to shrink. This widening gap now takes a clear economic form. You have a larger and larger number of people who need a larger and larger help in the future in terms of welfare. And at the same time, the described technological and market trends are making the national budgets, the national budgets, shrink. Right now, most countries are taxing only labor income and consumer goods, whereas they don't tax almost at all capital and wealth because of the tax competition problem. And uh, with this technological and economic trend, as I said, we have a shrinking labor, labor income for the fewer Joes. We have shrinking tax bills for the bobs. So all these things determine a smaller and smaller pie, whereas unemployed and pensioners are more and more who need a surviving slice. Clearly, this is unsustainable unless we abandon the national route. This type of global problems need global solutions. But which type of global solutions can go in the right directions? What can we do to guarantee that some of the Bob's extra profit generated through BIT will actually go to supporting the social programs for the Joes in need? What can we do to make the large, the rich, the extra rich, the multinational companies pay their share through capital taxes or corporate sales taxes, rather than just simply noticing that Amazon in 2018 made $11 billion profits and paid zero taxes. Well, 10% capital tax on all multinational companies, according to some estimates, could be enough to actually pay for most of unemployment insurance and welfare costs throughout the world. But even a 10% capital tax guaranteed on all possible, on all such players, is very hard to obtain. And so, what could be a way to do it? And I want to insist on this, and this is an addition I'm making here, because the multinational companies are not only those who benefit from capital taxes, capital tax reduction from tax competition, but are also those who benefit from international trade, because multinational companies constitute 80% of international trade. Therefore, the solution has to go straight to trade. And this is why I say that one solution could be a capital tax imposed indirectly by the World Trade Organization, where, in a sense, the World Trade Organization could ask each country to apply a capital tax in its own fiscal policy, in its own fiscal policy, as a precondition for renewed WTO membership. In a sense, the WTO would be saying, hey country, you like, right, the benefits of being an exporter protected by WTO. Yes, so do put a capital tax 
in your fiscal policy so that some of, the, some of Bob's extra profits generated through BIT can be channeled to the Joes. Otherwise, you're out. Now, Ireland, in such a context, for example, would be forced to suspend its loopholes that so exacerbated tax competition. And for some countries, this would be uh, easier. For, somebody, from, for some other countries, it would be harder. Enforcement, in general, of these things is very hard, like monitoring all fishermen, really. But the difficulties shouldn't scare us, because this is the only way to go. We have to go global. So it's very important. We need to learn this from the mistakes of the past. Before World War II, all countries retreated into no trade. There was no cooperation. There was no coordination towards solving global problems. The result was war. Only after the ravages of which country leaders found it necessary to sit together and find global solutions. The United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, and even Europe are eminent examples of crucial attempts to go for global solutions. So global solution is not an empty term. But we might take these things for granted. We might take not only the importance of these institutional solutions that emerged after World War II for granted, but even their very existence, because such institutions in the 1930s would have been considered utopian. So where does this existence come from? It comes from the realization after World War II, you know, World War II brought to the realization that national solutions can only bring us into painful walls. So this time, we need to move before the disaster. The political and economic disconnect I've described is widening, and acknowledging that national solutions are not the way to go is a key first step towards or to working towards global solutions.